You're listening to episode 14 of the On Being Human podcast. Heads up, this episode contains adult content. Welcome to the On Being Human podcast, where we believe transforming ourselves can positively transform society. Your host, Brandy Fleck, has the honor of exploring the human condition with real people who bravely share their personal stories of adversity, healing, joy, and more. If you're seeking empowerment, strength, and inspiration, listen in to engage and explore tough topics that help us humanize one another, understand ourselves better, spread love, and connect. We have such a treat for you today, a really fun episode. This week's guests are Meg and Craig Smith, a married couple who aren't afraid to open up about intimacy in their marriage, so you can start thinking about how you create intimacy in your own important relationships. Meg is a life coach, and you know I love getting life coaches on the show every now and then. She's known as your coach, Meg, and has been helping women with creative businesses build their dreams for eight years. Craig has a degree in psychology, is a success coach, and is also a senior executive for a venture capital firm. The couple's moved around over the years, meeting in the Southern California music scene, but lives in St. Louis, Missouri, by way of Murfreesboro, Tennessee. They have five grown children from Craig's first marriage, who Meg immediately loved as her own and later adopted. Their marriage to each other is a second for both. So tune in to laugh along with this animated and super sweet couple who genuinely enjoy each other's company so much, you can hear it dripping through their voices. Plus, hear what they love about each other. And what they put in their naughty stockings at Christmas. Oh, and one more thing. Remember the love story contest that ran through December and January? Let's hear from our winner real quick. Hello, my name is Brittany Fisher Kearns, and I wanted to add something up for the Valentine episode about my husband, Scott. Uh, well, my favorite story about us being together is that when we first started dating, we ate out a lot and gained a a good amount of weight, having a good time. And uh, when we would go out, we would order dessert. He'd order dessert a lot uh, for us. And he always gave me the cherry off the top of the ice cream. So I, I love the cherry on the top. So he gave it to me and over the years, this kept on until one day, after we were married even, I looked at him and I said, oh, are you eating a cherry? As he was. And he said, yeah. And I said, I thought you didn't like the cherry on top. And he said, no, I, I like cherries. I just know that you really like them. So uh, that kind of describes my guy and how uh, thoughtful he is and selfless he is, always giving uh, the last of everything and not leaving a whole lot for himself. And uh, so it made me aware of it. So I, I'm trying to be kind to him, <laughs> a little qu- kinder. That's my Valentine's story. That was so sweet, you guys. All right, let's dive into the episode. Hi, Megan Craig. Welcome to the show. How are you both doing today? Great. Outstanding. Yeah, how are you doing? I'm really well. It's a nice Friday night, and um, I'm super excited to talk to you guys about your relationship for the Valentine's Day episode. Yes. Yes. So... You guys are here today to talk about intimacy and marriage. Um, You both recently did a Facebook Live video about this, and it was really cool and informative. Um, Good. Yeah. So I was happy to attend that. And I just want to start a little bit by talking about the definition of intimacy. So um, dictionary.com says intimacy is the state of being intimate. Um, Intimate is one associated in close personal relations, and then warm friendship, being personally close, or suggests an atmosphere of privacy and personal connection. Um, Is there anything that you would add to that definition or clarify about it regarding romantic relationships? Well, I think the obvious one that they leave out in the dictionary is, you know, for 
for couples that are, are uh, in a relationship is a potential sexual aspect to it. But but otherwise, I think everything else is is all encompassing. You know, it can be a uh, a friendship. You can be, you know, intimate with um, you know somebody you work with just from the uh, friendship aspect of it. Um, uh, you know, your best friend. Uh, so it just really kind of depends on what the context is. But but I think that that pretty well covers it. Yeah, and I like to think of it as being like going deep, you know, like, because you can go deep with just about anybody going like a little bit under the surface, you know, and, and go as so you can build an intimacy, it doesn't have to stay in one level of intimacy, you can always build on that, you can always go deeper, whether it's in a friendship or not. Oh, yeah, that's a really good point. So would you say that like, like, the first level of intimacy might be friendship and then it sort of goes as a relationship uh, like would turn romantic or is it just different states of friendship or different states of a romantic? Yeah, I think it's different stages of, of friendship and, you know, romantic or not or whatever. I mean, because you can have a friend that's just maybe an acquaintance that you talk to every once in a while, maybe not so intimate, but as the, as you, you know, get more comfortable with each other, whether it's romantic or not, you're going to probably go a little bit deeper and build in that intimacy in the relationship. That's a really good point. Well, Megan and I started out as friends and kind of, you know, built into best friends and then, you know, into a romantic relationship. So just depending on the dynamics, you know, it, I, I would say that's certainly where it starts. Yeah. Okay. That's good to know. Um, so I was about to say, um, you guys both did in, in your Facebook live, you said that you're not mm. experts at intimacy and marriage, but what I liked about it was that you've been married for, uh, 14 years, 15 years this August, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And you've been together for 16. So can you tell me a little bit about, your friendship and how that evolved. Uh, well, interesting. Megan and I used to be in the music industry in Southern California um, from both the uh, artist side. And we also owned a record label for a while and we were involved in some uh, media in terms of online music magazines, um, doing some videos, some music interviews, uh, different types of pieces. Megan uh, had her own, uh, fanzine for a while that was uh, popular in um, Southern California. So we we ended up um, being in the same circle uh, in terms of the music world. Um, and ironically enough, we were in a in a in a chat room um, to where we we first, you know, technically, you know, uh, became aware of each other. And, you know, we were obviously in the same general vicinity, a lot of uh, people that were active in that scene were in Southern California. We ended up uh, being at a group meetup. Um, you know, um, we were both married to other people at the time and that's when we became friends. And, um, uh, so that's where the relationship started. Gotcha. Very cool. Um, that's interesting that you guys were both in the same circle and, um, you mentioned chat rooms. So was this like AOL chat room type stuff? Oh my or? gosh. Well, it was before Facebook. That's for sure. Okay. It was, um, it was a, um, a music site called the Electro Garden Network. And essentially, uh, we were in a music scene kind of known as synth pop slash goth slash industrial music. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, a lot of the local artists and also, um, a lot of the fans, tended to congregate on this site um it was also it was worldwide so it, you know we made i had friendships from that from you know, people yeah. from europe that we're still in connection with that are also in the music business um and uh it just so happened a, a big group of us were from the los angeles area and a lot of us connected and you know, we were involved in music festivals uh, meetups you know a attending each other's shows going to different shows together it, it was an interesting time it sounds very cool. Um, so let's learn a little bit more about you guys. What what do each of you do for a living? Where are you from? Um, I know you mentioned California, but uh, maybe where are you living now? Um, uh, how many kids do you have? Things like that. Sure. Well, um, so I am a life coach. I 
um, and helping women creative small business owners um, just absolutely die for their dreams for the past eight years now. So I have clients all over the country and um, I do I do meet with people in person here in St. Louis where we're living, but then I also um, have clients just all over the place that we do video and phone calls and um, and I absolutely love it. Um, and we have five kids and um, they're all big old adults now. Awesome. Um, yes, our youngest is 20, our oldest is 27, and they're all from Craig's first marriage. So I don't know if that's a good segue into Craig, you talking about what you do. <laughs> sure, I'm a senior executive for a venture capital firm here in St. Louis. Okay. Uh, I was born in Chicago, grew up in Southern California in Orange County. Um, I've lived in Seattle, um, Boise, Idaho. Obviously, Nashville, uh, we spent almost 10 years in Nashville. So uh, we spent almost two years, a year and a half in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. So we're well-traveled and we're kind of from everywhere. <laughs> yeah, for the most part. Yeah. Gotcha. So did you move around a lot for your job? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So uh, what is the most important thing in life to both of you? Well, the cliche answer is each other, right? <laughs> uh, that's, hey, you're on a relationship show. Say each other. Right. Uh, but to be honest with you, it is, at least for me. You know, yeah. it, it's Megan and our family. Um, you know, I've, you know, ch chased the almighty dollar. I've chased fame. I've uh, chased just about everything that, you know, is alluring to most people in this world. And uh, had varying levels of success or failure in these different areas. And I can honestly tell you that uh, Megan changed my life. Um, you know, she gave me hope in, in a time that was very, very dark. And uh, you know, she's, uh, she is my world. Oh, that's so sweet. Well, I was going to say something similar. For me, it's relationship just in general. I just, I'm huge on just knowing people and going deep and being intimate on, you know, on lots of friendship levels and, and all the things. Um, I love knowing people and really seeing authentically who they are. And I feel like that's what it's all about. It's about people and relationships. Sure. I definitely agree with that one. Um, and so that brings me to, I know that Valentine's Day is important. It's a special day to you guys. Why is it special and how do you celebrate it? It's my birthday. That's why it's special. Oh. Yeah, so I get presents on, on, for his birthday on Valentine's Day. <laughs> That's why yes. it's special. <laughs> that is why it's special. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's funny. No, that's okay. So do you, right, um, oh, go does Craig get a Valentine's Day present and a birthday present or do you combine it? Um, he gets both. Okay. Yeah, okay. Definitely. I'm all about gifts. So we definitely do all the yeah. gifts. Next yeah. love language is gifts and acts of service. No. Words no, of affirmation. Words of affirmation. <laughs> Your third one is actually acts okay. of service. All right. Just so you know, sure. words of affirmation. Okay. So, uh, yeah, gifts are a big thing for her. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. And what are your love languages, Craig? Uh, physical touch and quality time. All right. Those are, so you've got a lot of things, a lot of love languages covered there, you guys. Right. Yeah. So you did mention that this marriage is a second marriage. Um, I know for Craig, but this is a second marriage for both of you. Is that right? Yes. Yes, it is. I was married just for a year and a half. Um, and he was married for a lot longer than that. Um, but yeah, my first marriage is only a year and a half, so there were no kids or or anything like that. Okay. Yeah, I was married <clears throat> for eleven years um, before we separated. Uh, I got married very young, um, so you know, uh, had to be figure out ways to uh, try to uh, support a large family. We ended up having five children. Very unconventional situation. Mm -hmm. Uh, when we separated, Megan um, ended up uh, being the full-time uh, caregiver to our children. Once we got together, they view her as mother. Um, they call her mom. Um, she ended up legally adopting them all. 
um, at one point. So she's on their birth certificates and everything. It's a awesome. very unique relationship. Uh, even though the kids kind of look like her. So, you know, <laughs> plus Megan, you know, uh, you know, I'm in my uh, middle forties, Megan's in her uh, early forties and um, she looks young on top of that. You know, she actually looks like she's probably in her late twenties. Um, <laughs> so we get a lot of weird looks. Mm, yes. Uh, um, when we start talking about we have a 27 year old son uh you know our youngest is 20 and funny story is um our oldest son had surgery <laughs> last week and they thought that she was his girlfriend oh yeah. no <laughs> they thought my mom was his mom and i was the significant other and oh, it wow. was precious yeah yeah he loved that well he was drugged up he didn't know <laughs> <laughs> but but so that that's a you know a little bit you know just in a very very small uh, you know, snapshot. Um, yeah. You know what that looks like. Gotcha. So, um, do you mind if I ask why, or like how you became the full time caretaker? How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I'll start, and then I'll let kind of uh, Megan kind of jump in. Okay. Um, uh, when we got separated uh, with my uh, previous uh, marriage. Um, uh, she really struggled you know, in a lot of different ways. She had struggled all her life and, you know, various different, different, uh, relationships and without, you know, going into too much detail. Cause I, you know, I don't want anybody that knows her or thinks anything you know, sure. about her in, in a negative way, but she just had a really hard time, had some really challenge, some really big challenges in her life. And she came to the conclusion and it became very, you know, very obvious to, to everybody that she just wasn't going to be able to um, fill the role that the kids need. And I give her a lot of credit for coming to that realization. And uh, for sure. you know, we ended up having full custody of all the kids relatively quickly mm -hmm. um, once we were together. Um, and it just evolved into a situation to where she was having less and less to do with them. There was some more backstory and she just agreed to, uh, relinquish all her parental rights so that Megan could legally adopt him because they truly view her as mom. Um, and we, our concern was if something happened to me and all the kids were still minors at this time, that, that regardless of their relationship, the legal system would have viewed my previous wife as their, uh, as their caregiver and mm -hmm. legally, you know, the kids would have gone to her. So we wanted to make sure that that we closed the loop on that since the relationship dynamic was so different than maybe the traditional situation. Right. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. So yeah. I imagine Meg, your <laughs> life was really enriched by this. Would you say that? Enriched? Yes, That's absolutely. That's a great word for it. Um, yeah, I was 27 and all of a sudden had five kids uh, under like 12 and under. So that was fun. Yeah. Um, and you know, and the crazy dynamics of being a blended family and, you know, ex-wife, uh, you know, all those types of things. And um, my parents became instant grandparents. Mm -hmm. You know, my brother became an instant uncle, all the yeah. things. Oh, yeah. And, um, you know, it's it was a lot. And Craig worked a lot and was gone a lot. So, um, you know, I didn't have all the years leading up to our kids ages to kind of learn ropes or I didn't even babysit when I was younger. I literally didn't change a diaper until last year. I had never changed a diaper. So, um, but well, that's okay. you know, you, yeah, right. Um, and I did, and I was very excited about that, but, um, you know, you do what you have to do and, you know, it wasn't the kid's fault, you know, anything was going on and, um, we all just kind of hung in there together and learned as we went. And I probably did some stupid things and whatever, but I think we all turned out okay. Yeah, I mean, there were definitely some rough patches along the road. Right, especially sure. Especially as the kids got into their adolescent, and, you know, trying to figure out, well, you know, what really happened here and what's yeah. going on. And, you know, I would say really um, our, our last, last of our children, one of our, actually our middle child, has just now kind of at the age of 24 kind of figured it all out. Yeah. You know, uh, you know so, so it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic for them, but um, to be honest with you, it's the best thing that could ever happen to everybody, in my opinion. Sure. Gotcha. Shifting back to 
the relationship perspective um, from your previous marriages. What were you able, both of you, to improve on and, and do better for this one based on what you learned from the last ones? Uh, for me, it was the friendship first. Um, you know, the one thing that Megan and I always state is, you know, friendship first is the fact that we were friends and then best friends and then became, you know, um, romantic. We can always go back to the friendship. So, you know, that that's really been the key yeah. for us. You know, there's there's so many mistakes that that people make, you know, uh, in terms of rushing into relationships, getting caught up in the romance of it, the electricity of it, that sometimes bad decisions are just made. Um, but, you know, for me, it was that. And also, you know, I was, I, to be honest, I was selfish in a lot of ways in my first marriage. And, you know, what I always try to run the, the filter through with uh, my relationship with Megan is, what does Megan want? What does she need? And um, instead of trying to think of, well, what's best for me in this situation, that's the filter I run it through. I'm probably successful. I don't know, 75 to 80 percent of the times I'm far from perfect. <laughs> uh, all of us have our selfish moments, but mm-hmm. but it's really intentionality. Yeah, you know, that's the other thing that's big in our relationship is intentionality, and for sure. that's really hard to do. Yeah, and I would say for me, I had a lot of bad, bad relationships. Um, not like a lot, a lot, but I had all of my relationships were pretty bad before Craig. I wouldn't even say I had one healthy one. So, um, luckily, you know, he was really patient with me. So I could get, I could figure out healthy in the middle of all that. We had a great therapist that we saw separately and together and our kids even saw this therapist and that kind of, that helped a lot. Um, that, you know, I never had anything like that with my ex-husband. It was just, we just were married, you know, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, there wasn't really ever, you know, he was never interested in fixing anything or getting better or healthier or anything. So the fact that Craig is so patient with me and wanted to figure things out and work things out and do it in a healthy way just changed everything. Gotcha. There's some really great takeaways in there. So I heard you mention, yeah, um, like friendship as a foundation, um, intentionality, patience, and working on things, and therapy. Like, you know, people can get a therapist if they need one, and there's that, that can be really helpful. About the institution of marriage, uh, before we dive into some of your really cool relationship details, um, just from a higher level. I was reading an article a while back that um, asserted that just as an individual can develop through Maslow's hierarchy of needs to fulfillment, that marriage Mm -hmm. as an institution has done that, if you look at the history of it from why it started until into how it's evolved to today. So we put a lot more pressure on marriage to fulfill more than just basic survival needs. The stakes are higher, but the reward is also greater. What do you guys think about that and the institution of marriage as a whole? Well, if you want to get into, you know, the, you know, anthropological look at it, you know, it's, you know, you know, marriage, you know, initially, well, I, you know, you could say that it, that it has the uh, reproductive aspect to it, right. To where it was at, at one point, it was about the survival of the species, and um, uh, but but ultimately, what I think marriage has evolved into um, is is a little bit of a fantasy and a myth that mm-hmm. people are trying to achieve and attain something that has been idealized either by television or different media about how. You know, things are supposed to be and things are, um, you know, supposed to look. And when the partner doesn't necessarily fit that 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 bill, because nobody does. Right. Nobody's Mm -hmm. perfect. Mm -hmm. There's this big disappointment to where everybody thinks that their spouse is going to complete them or be the uh, missing piece of the puzzle that, uh, you know, is going to make everything, you know, wonderful. Um to where, you know, marriage can be put on a pedestal. Um, But to me, you know, what it is, is having a partner, 
you know, if you're going to ask, you know, what, what need does it fill for me? You know, um, you know, that's really what it means to me is having a partner, somebody to do life with that when things are rough for me, you know, I can step back and, and count on them to help lift me up. Same for Megan to be each other's cheerleaders. So, you know, you can kind of, you know, get really, really deep into this and you can get into a lot of the psychological aspects of it. But, um, you know, th that to me is, is what it means to me is, you know, more on the higher level of the hierarchy of needs. Um, you know, they, they say behind every great man uh, is a woman. Well, that's obviously a kind of a very sexist uh, approach to it. But I think what they're really saying is that behind any successful person, there's usually somebody in their life that has been supportive of them, whether it's a friend, whether it's a spouse, whether it's a family member. That's true. We can't get through this life and be successful without the help and support of others. And it doesn't have to necessarily come from a spouse. It can come from a best friend. It can come from a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a, a parent, a brother, a sister, maybe even a mentor in life. So, you know, I don't think the convention of marriage necessarily looks the same as mm -hmm. it did in 1950. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for for example, um but now it's, it really needs to be a partnership. And um, instead of looking at what can I get out of this marriage, what can my spouse or my significant other give to me, it, you need to flip that script. You know, yeah. it's, it's what can I do for them? You know, what, what can I do to help lift them up? Because, you know, there's in general a lot of reciprocity to where when you give, you get now obviously there are exceptions to that rule and if you're in an abusive or in a relationship that's toxic that's a completely different story and you need to find you know either the the therapeutic help uh, a counselor or if you need to escape you need to escape but at, at the end of the end of the day you know you need to see what can i do for this person in my life and in turn it just grows a relationship from there very cool i really love a lot of the stuff you just said, and that was a really positive spin to put on, uh, you know, instead of behind every man, there's a great woman. It's or however the saying goes, it's more like, absolutely, you need a support system. Yes. So I will just go ahead and ask you guys, do you believe in the concept of soulmates? Yes, a thousand percent. Oh, tell me about it. I just, I mean done like that's definitely us and I can't imagine anything different so I mean and we I think we knew that like in the very beginning wow like you we were brought kinda, together yeah well there was an instant you know chemistry and friendship between us that just was otherworldly to be yeah. honest with you even when we were married to other people and you know, I, I, I'm not going to say that our relationship together is what caused our divorces because it really didn't. There was, you know, oh, a gosh, bunch of no. other things that were going on. Mm -hmm. uh, but we were able to lean on each other and be support for each other when we were going through a lot of the garbage we were going through. And that's kind of where, you know, everything just kind of clicked. And, um, you know, uh, so, so I, I firmly believe that there's a reason why we're together and, you know, uh, you know, that, um, we found each other when we needed to. And, um, I think we were just smart enough to realize it. Yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of people try to fight these types of situations too, or they try mm -hmm. to overanalyze things. And, um, you know, when you know, you know, 95% of the time, I believe our guts are right. Well, cause you know, like I wasn't, you know, a little girl, fantasizing about marrying a man with five kids when I was a I little kid. I don't think anybody. <laughs> you know, like that, that really wasn't it. Um, but sure. When, when it all happened, it just all made sense. Right. You know, um, and I believe with the kids too, it was like a no brainer kind of, it's just, it is what it is. And countless times we've seen how our kids have just been protected mm -hmm. by stuff you know like when we've moved and right after we moved like a big thing would happen where the kids would have been in a really awful situation or whatever like I definitely feel that our family has this kind of soul mate kind of connection around it yeah definitely yeah. Very to be cool. honest with you when we got married uh, the kids were in the wedding ceremony yeah. and 
um, the kids got all rings. Got, yeah. All got rings too. So oh, you know, nice. Megan just wasn't marrying me. She was marrying the kids as well. Right. Very good point. Very cool. So what was it like falling in love with each other? Um, what, what is your love story? Um, tell me about the emotions that you experienced and what you went through. <laughs> Just looking at each other. Uh, pretty spicy, I would say. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah I mean, that's a kid's def- show. <laughs> yeah, there was definitely a, a major physical aspect to our relationship. Um, you know, it was... You know, Megan was uh, a minor celebrity at the time, oh, at goodness. least in the uh, the uh, music group that we were running through. Um, you know, a lot of the bands that we were with uh, and and friends with, they actually had a low level of success. You know, a lot of the bands you would actually be familiar with uh, some of their music um, still gets played to this day. Uh, so you know, it would. Where are you going yeah, with that? Well, no, where I'm going with is that, you know, she just kind of, you know, rocked my world. She oh, my God. You know, beautiful woman, uh, songstress, uh, great voice, um, great personality. And, you know, I was like a puppy dog. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, you know, I had I had never, you know, met someone who actually treated a man that really treated me like their equal. Mm-hmm. and took me seriously and wasn't or wasn't scared of me or you know um really had the confidence and everything because I'm I mean I'm a pretty outgoing person and I have a lot of friends and I enjoy that and I enjoy you know meeting people and whatever and Craig loved that about me he wasn't intimidated by that he wasn't you know, jealous or, or anything like that. Um, I felt like I had finally met my match. Mm-hmm. And so we definitely, um, yeah, bonded that way. Awesome. <laughs> we like to do a lot of the same things too. We had a lot of the same interests. So yeah, that helps. Um, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay, great. So I definitely want to talk about the physical aspects of intimacy, but before we get to that part, can let's go back to the being intentional um, takeaway here. And can you give us some examples of how to be intentional with prioritizing one another? Yeah. So love languages is a great place to start with that. Um, you can go online and do the, go to five love and take your little love language quiz to find out how your partner and how you best give and receive love. And it is so important to do these things. You can even do it for your kids. You can do it for friends, your parents, whatever. Um, But everybody speaks a different love language. And if you don't know what your spouse is or whoever you're building intimacy with, if you don't know what their love language is, chances are you're probably speaking your own love language to them with which might not necessarily be theirs. Yeah, my assumption was since it's my love language, I wasn't even really familiar with what is a love language, right? I just thought, oh. I like this. I like that. Obviously, everybody else does. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it, it was kind of a light went on for me. Like, oh, everybody's different. We need to interrelate different. You know, we need right. to focus on different things. And um, for me, it was natural to pick up on that Megan loves gifts, whether it's to receive or to give them. So, you know, that was intuitive towards me. But, uh, you know, for me, but, you know, the fact that, um, you know, her other love language, you know, is, you know, centered around. Uh, words of affirmation, you know, that's not something that comes naturally to me. And like learning that, let me know that even something that I would say that I would view as being neutral to or or even, you know, maybe accurate if I was going to (laughs) say something corrective or something that I thought that I wasn't happy with, unhappy with that might affect me on a scale from one to 10 as a two in negativity might be a 10 for her. Oh my gosh, I'd be crushed. Yeah. So I just had to be very um, aware of, you know what, the words that I'm using, I have to be very careful about. And I tend to have a sarcastic sense of humor. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I still am. But, uh, you know, I I just really am am careful about what I'm sarcastic about, because, uh, you know, words cut. And even if you don't don't mean it intentionally, 
you know, the, the other individual is going to have a, a completely different takeaway. And, um, you know, I think, you know, the fact that, that um, my love languages are, are physical touch and, um, you know, quality time, I, I think that was a, a, a light one on for Megan as well. Yeah, for sure. Because where he scored like a 10 on physical touch, I scored like a 1. Gotcha. So, I um, mean, that's been a struggle for us. And I've had to be very, very intentional about it. And we've had to communicate to make sure that um, that we're both getting what each other needs. And if not, we need to talk about it. We need to figure it out. And physical touch isn't necessarily sex. I mean, right. That's an element of it. But it could be just as much as, you know, putting your hand on someone's shoulder or holding hands or, you know, snuggling while you're watching TV. Yeah. You know, for me, sometimes I'll just tell Megan. I say, you know what, Megan, can you just, you know, rub my arm for a minute? Yeah, or pat his head or yeah, something. And know. he's happy as a clam. Yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. It, it means the world to me. Right. So, I mean, that's where I like to start with the intentionality. The other thing that I could bring up would be about like when he traveled a lot and was gone a lot, we had to be intentional in thinking outside the box to build intimacy, whether it was, you know, um, I, you know, I would, I would hide cards and little gifts in his luggage, or he'd always come back with a stuffed animal for me. And I had a lot of stuffed animals, um, or (laughs) because he was gone a lot. Or like FaceTiming while you're away or, you know, even one of our kids had the coolest idea. They were in a long distance relationship. He and his girlfriend at the time, they would cook the same dinner where they were, but they would do it over like Skype. So they were both having the same dinner together, like a date, but they were far away. Oh, wow. Yeah. So like thinking outside the box that way. You know, so that you um, are intentional about about your relationship and speaking those love languages to each other. Sure. Um, so has how you're intentional changed over the years? Maybe what we're intentional about is, yeah. um, you know, I think we all go through phases to where we get lazy and we forget. <laughs> um or, you know, life gets busy and you forget, but we always tend to, you know, you know come back to it. Um, but I would say maybe the, the things we're intentional about might be slightly different, um, just depending on the period of, of life we're in. And uh, what the needs are, I think, yeah. too. So I don't, I, you know, intentionality really, if you're going to be successful at it, needs to be something that becomes a habit. Yeah. Um, it's just there, a way of life. Yeah, there are probably it probably is just automatic in some instances. You know, at this point, like when I go to a when I go to a store or a boutique, you know, sometimes I'll try to go out of my way to to see something, find something different or unique, and it just becomes a habit. Um, matter of fact, I think sometimes I overdo it. Uh-huh. It's um, great though. Don't stop. <laughs> um, but you know, I think what really happens is the longer you get to know somebody, the more you kind of hone into your target target area and, yeah and really you know pay attention to to things with the other you know sometimes i'll just listen to what she says you know with her friends or things that she posts on social media or comments she makes and i just make a mental note of it and i happen to be somewhere or maybe i go out of my way or i order something online and, yeah and, it, and it'll just show up like for example christmas this year she probably got a ton of gifts but they weren't all just on christmas they just yeah. all kind of trickled in because I have this problem of getting something that I know she's going to be really excited about and not being able to wait to give it to her. (laughs) Yeah. Super fun. So it's actually kind of become giving presents has sort of become a love language for me because of how excited she gets and how much I see, you know, it really means to her. It's become, you know, something that I really enjoy. He's really good at it too. Awesome. So what was your favorite gift that you got? Ever? Uh, Um, well, oh sure. Goodness. Well, I was going to say this Christmas, but you can do ever, forever. <sighs> gosh. We did naughty stocking. Oh, this. we did. That was so fun. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, we each gave each other a naughty stocking for for Christmas where we just we filled it full of naughty things that we thought the other person would enjoy. Okay. And that's been fun going through that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Can you tell me what, what goes into a naughty stocking? What are some of these things? I mean, what doesn't go into a naughty uh, stocking? So, uh, there's sex toys in there. Yeah. 
not say for what coloring books because I thought it was funny. Um, boy. Handcuffs? Handcuffs. Oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, there was a lot in there. Yeah, that was pretty good. Uh, That's a good uh, idea. Little, yeah. Uh, clamp on body jewelry and I'll let you use your imagination on where those go. <laughs> okay. Three different spots. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, just, you know, lots, lots of fun stuff like that. Yeah. Very cool. Probably went a little overboard there. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> We'd never done that before. That was fun. That was, and, you know, I'll tell you, with being the fact that, the fact that we've both been married before, we don't get firsts mm-hmm. a whole lot, you know, in our, in our 16 years that we've been together. It's hard to find firsts. Like, when we got married, well, we had already done that before. Mm-hmm. He's already had a bunch of kids, you know, like. We'd already done, you know, a lot of things. So whenever we find first, we pretty much celebrate the crap out of them. Yeah. So when we thought of dirty stockings, we're like, yeah, first. Here go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point. So to keep going with the physical intimacy aspect of things, how, how do you keep the spark going over the years and as life changes and things like that? What are some, some things you guys do? Well, one thing um, that we talked a little bit about um, on the Mondays with Meg was um, candle idea, getting a wood wick candle. I mean, if we're going to be practical on how you keep going with this while you have kids and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So you go buy a wood wick candle. They're the kind that have an actual wood wick. So it sounds like crackling wood Mm -hmm. when you burn it. And you make a deal with each other that if one of you lights this candle, you're telling the other one, you want to be intimate. You want to be intimate that night. It's kind of like your bat signal for, you know, for, so you don't have to say it and you don't have to feel like, you know, um, like you're bugging them or whatever or begging for or, begging <laughs> or whatever, you know, cause we do that. We end up feeling like, gosh, you know, I'm always the one that has to whatever. Mm-hmm. So, um, so whichever one of you lights this candle, you're sending the signal to the other person that you want to be intimate. So then that other person needs to do whatever they need to do to get ready for that. And, and the deal is that you do it, that you're intimate. Um, whatever that looks like for you. So, cause I know a lot of people, what I hear all the time from my coaching clients or whatever is they get tired of always bringing it up and, you know, and all those things. So I think that's, that's a thing. Um, I think also, um, talking about it, you know, talking about what's going on and if you're not happy with something or if you want to try something different. I think that's important to do to actually, you know, be open to communication and really listen to your partner with what they have to say. And one of the things we've done recently um, is there's this app you can get, um, you know, in in your local app store uh, that's called Desire. And it's kind of like a truth or dare type concept without the truth, to be honest with you. It's It's just dare. It's just dare. And (laughs) there are different um, template type you know, dares in there that are either relational, sexual, um, you name it, you name every it. kind it's of love there. language every is represented. Kind of, yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, you can either, you know, do a template dare community dares that other people have created, or you can create your own. So maybe one might be an example of is, um, you know, go to your local bar, meet there separately, pretend it's, you know, your first date or, and you're going on a blind date, you know, things like that. Or, yeah, you know, what are some other examples that you can think of? Um, well, there were different ones like, uh, like the naughty stockings. That was a dare that we got from there. Oh, um, there's also, there are ones where you just, um, you make sports in the living room and watch movies all day. Um, there's some about, um, you know, trying some different things that you haven't done before. And you can either make them up or do the one that's on there, but then you can pick the time frame that the person that your partner has to complete the dare. And then you get points. And the more points you get, you unlock spicier type dares. Yeah. I mean, it, it rates, there's different, like there's, uh, you know, mild, hot, um, spicy and like chili, you know, yeah. so, you know, they're, <laughs> some pretty far out things in there, to be honest with yeah. you, that, you know, maybe not everybody's going to be comfortable with, but, but, it's but again, fun. you have the, you have the option to say, nah, that's not really my thing. 
and you know you're good to go and it, and it kind of also helps to uh, indirectly maybe push the boundaries of maybe maybe you wouldn't want to necessarily sit down and say hey man you want to do this but if you kind of send it through yeah the dare you kind of can take the temperature and it's a little less intimidating mm-hmm. and uh you know, uh, Megan and I have a, a no, you know, no judgment zone, you know, it's a yeah. judgment free zone. So, you know, we can be as conservative or as crazy as we want to be. And, you know, we, we're some crazy kids sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Cool. I mean, it's a great way to kind of spice things up a little bit and just get out, you know, do something different. Cause it's easy to get in a rut after you've been together for a minute, Sure. you know, to just do the same things and that gets boring. So it kind of helps you think outside the box a little bit. Absolutely. Okay. So from a professional perspective as a life coach, Meg, and as um, I know in Facebook Live, you mentioned that you're a success coach, Craig. Um, What would you say to a couple who is struggling with physical intimacy? Ask if they've actually talked about it and, and communicated with each other. And if that's something that they're struggling with, then I would suggest that they get some professional help with that. Yeah, which, uh, you know, there are, there are you know, uh, professionals um, that deal just with uh, sexual and relationship issues. Um, you know, obviously there are uh, intimacy experts out there. There are sex therapists. There are, um, you, know, uh, you know, counselors out there. Just need to make sure that you you have somebody that's uh, comfortable and, and kind of knows yeah. what they're talking about, you know, in that particular, particular field. But yeah, the first thing is communication, um, getting to the bottom of what the issue is. I mean, we've had our issues at times. Um, yeah. everybody does, mm-hmm. you know, it's just, it's just human nature. You know, is it something that's medical? Is it something that's psychological? Is it just, you're too busy? Is it not being intentional? You know, you just need to have that honest communication, but too often. And I fell into this trap, a lot is to where, you know, I would take my ball and go home. You know, maybe I did, I felt I wasn't getting the attention that I wanted. And, you know, I felt, well, why should I have to tell her? Blah, blah, blah. She should just know. I mean, that's just counterproductive. You know, that, right. it's that's, just, that's ultimately being selfish, right? You're, you're putting the onus on the other individual to where, you know, uh, you know, if you need help or if something's going on, you need to let the other person know. And let them know why it's important to you and yeah. what the struggles are. And maybe you'll find something out. You know, maybe, you know, if it's a it's a woman that's not getting the attention, you know, from from their uh, significant other, you know, maybe there's, you know, something going on they don't know about. It could be medical. It could be, you know, it, it could be, you know, depression. You know, I, I think more often than not, if you get down to the crux of why, you know, somebody's struggling with intimacy, it usually has something to do that's going on between the ears, either, right. a, either a perceived slight or real slight, um, or, you know, maybe, a, a a notion or a thought in their head that's not accurate. You know, they're oftentimes, you know, if I'm feeling insecure and, you know, I have, I struggle with that from time to time, um, you know, I can make a bigger deal out of something that really isn't, Tended to be that way and if I don't communicate it I'm just going to spew in my own juices and it's going to get worse yeah that makes a lot of sense so really good stuff there and um, one of the things that you mentioned earlier that I really liked was the no judgment zone I think that that would it, it just helps in so many ways when you're not constantly judging your partner and you're right. you're free to be who you are basically yeah for sure yeah I mean you know, Megan and I are just, I guess we're just unconventional by nature and just about everything we do. And, you know, um, and I think the fact that we allow each other to be ourselves, to be unique, um, it just strengthens our bond in our relationship. Um, and sometimes it's just fun to see what Megan's going to do next, you know, whether it's, <laughs> you know, um, in the bedroom, whether it's, you know, just out and about, um, you know, she's just a very exciting, dynamic individual. And, you know, I really enjoy the fact that she is so outgoing and she kind of pushes me, you know, into more of a, a, uh, uh, social aspect. I tend to be more of an individual who's, you know, I'm just happy 
hanging out at home all the time. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I tend to be a little bit more cynical than Megan. She's a little bit more naive, I think, yeah, when it comes for to sure. people. You know, I'm kind of like, all right, what's wrong with this person? And Megan's like, <laughs> oh, you're great. Let's have fun. You know, so, so we kind of, you know, balance each other out that way. I, yeah. I help her have some discernment around maybe people she could trust or maybe some people that, you know, that are safe. Because I have a, I have a real good eye for, you know, discerning where somebody is at in terms of their intentionality or their uh, personality. And, uh, you know, and Megan helps me maybe not judge people too soon and to kind of uh, have a little bit more of an open mind. Very cool. So I can tell that you guys have a ton of chemistry. I mean, just how you guys are talking about each other and things like that. And you mentioned on your Facebook Live that you both still enjoy each other's company. So what's behind that? That's a good question. Um, I think the fact that we appreciate who we are individually and we even like celebrate that because we are so different from one another. But at the same time, um, we love that we're different from one another. We, we feel like we complete each other in that way. And that might sound cheesy, but I feel like it's like really the case. So we like a lot of the same things. He knows how to make me laugh like crazy. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think that has a lot to do with it. Gentlemen out there, just so you know, if you can make a, a woman laugh, you are in. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So true. Uh, so yeah. true. You know, in the past, you know, I've had girlfriends that wanted me to dress a certain way, look a certain way, act a certain way. And, you know, we're just kind of who we are. Yeah. Although I did get rid of those motorcycle boots when we first started dating. <laughs> yeah. and, the, and the dad sweaters. <laughs> yes, my motorcycle boots disappeared one day and I'm like... <laughs> What happened? what happened to my motor? I don't know. Yeah. And then a couple of years later, she uh, fessed up. And yeah, she they were awful. They needed to go. <laughs> okay, so this is a great segue into conflict resolution, I think. Oh, oh absolutely. Yeah, so, um, so something I've learned over the course of being married and divorced is that it's it's important to still be very clear about um, loving the person you're with, even if there's a disagreement and during that conflict, would you agree? And how do you approach resolving conflict while maintaining intimacy? Well, I think first you just have to accept the fact that you're just not going to always agree. <laughs> um, you know, secondarily, I've learned that I need to take a time out sometimes when we were. And I need to let you take a time out. Yeah, there, there were times to where. Megan and I would get in a disagreement, and even if I knew I was wrong, I wouldn't admit I was wrong, because I wasn't going to admit I was wrong because I was mad. <laughs> and she would keep pursuing me. You know you're wrong. You know you're wrong. I'm like, uh. <laughs> so we, so 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 usually what would happen is I'd be like, all right, I need some time. Go away. And um, you know she'd go away, and then I would have time to reflect on it. So I think too often we try to have resolutions or or come to some kind of agreement when they're when emotions are running high when actually sometimes the best time is just to take a time out um you know that there's that old adage don't go to bed angry mm -hmm. well <laughs> maybe uh, <laughs> but if nothing good is going to continue to come out of that conversation that night if you know maybe you do need to take a time out whether it happens to be you know going to bed or maybe it happens to be you know, you take 30 minutes and you go for a walk and, you know, usually I would uh, come to the conclusion, you know, well, there's a different perspective on this. Um, and I also came to the conclusion pretty easily that, you know, if I wanted to be happy and if I wanted to have a good relationship, it was less important about who is right. And it's more important about, all right, you know, how do I make Megan feel the way she needs to feel without compromising my integrity. And at the end of the day, almost everything that we were in arguments about was superficial. And yeah. if you get down to the, get down to the brass tacks of it, and, you know, I, I just became less interested in being right and more interested in being happy. Yeah. That's a really good, good point there. 
I, I don't know. I, I also try not to take myself too seriously. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, that's hard sometimes for men to do because, you know, there are, there are roles and expectations we're supposed to play in life, just like, you know, there are socio, um, you know, uh, roles that a lot of people expect women to play. And those are all changing. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a dynamic that's in flux. And a lot of people are trying to figure out, you know, what are the rules in uh, 2019? Because maybe they're different than when we were raised. Uh, they might be different than last year. And, you know, I, I think it's just important if you put other people's thoughts and feelings, you know, ahead of your own, yeah. you know, if you, whether you agree, for example, if, if somebody, let's just use a, a hot topic right now, it's transgendered, it doesn't matter what I think. It's like, how do you, how does that individual feel? How do they want to be treated? It's not for me to like, you know, force my thoughts and beliefs down somebody else's throats because they're not going to be receptive to it anyway. But, you know, it, it really comes down to, you know, caring more about other people, whether that's your spouse or right. your friend or the person you're sitting next to in the diner. You know, yeah. it, it's just, I don't know, it's just being, being nice. Yeah, sure. Yeah. What do you think your kids have learned from how you treat one another? And do you see the impact of that in their lives? I think they've, <laughs> they've learned uh how to how to really care for for other people i think like in, intensely intimately really caring mm-hmm. i i believe that that's something that we really share whether it's w- what they see in our relationship or even how we care for them or just other people in our lives um that's something i think is just really caring deeply for um for other people including us yeah one of the things that's important to me is that we're modeling you know what they should want in relationships in their own life Mm -hmm. um you know for example you know meg says all the time you know to vicky whenever i i do something that particularly means something to her it's like pay attention this is who your partner you know, should this is how your partner should treat you. Yes. You know, this is what you need to be looking for in somebody else. And, you know, I, I see that in, we have one son that's married, and I see that in his relationship with his wife yeah. um, as well. And actually, I think we've had an influence on her as well to what, sure. what she's seen modeled in our relationship. So whether it's good behavior or <laughs> bad behavior, everybody's paying attention. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, you know. Um, well, and we we make my mom roll her eyes at us all the time because we're so cute and, <laughs> <laughs> and she'll just go, Oh, you know, and roll her eyes. But, um, he'll all the time, he'll just, well, you know, if we'll have a room of all of our family or friends around, he'll just come up and give me a hug and just say how much he loves me. Or he'll say, isn't Meg great. And just, you know, all these things where everyone might roll their eyes, but he's showing them just how much he cares for me. Mm-hmm. And I think it's important for our kids, you know, to see that. Very cool. So, Meg, how did bonding with your children at first contribute to the bond that you have with Craig? And then mm. after you answer this, I will post, would pose the same question to Craig, but how did that interaction make you feel about her? Well, honestly, like, kids and I pretty much bonded straight away. Um, our oldest and I he, he was the one who was kind of like, not sure. But, um, so I really just met him on his level and was into stuff he was into and asked him questions about it. I, I read books he was reading, you know, I really showed an interest and he got along great pretty quickly. Um, but I really did with all the kids and, you know, I just, you know, I played with them, but I also let them know my boundaries. And I was, I was clear with them on, you know, that I wasn't trying to replace their, their biological mom. And I just was there to be who I am to them. And, um, and it just was like a natural kind of fit for us. I don't really know how else to put that. Sure. Um, for me, yeah, the, the, the moment that just kind of pops out into my head is that our middle son, um, Dustin was eight when, um, Megan first moved when we moved in together and um, 
And I just remember a particular time. This was before we had them full time and we had our weekly uh, visits. You know, we had the kids every weekend. Uh, and I just remember a particular time that Dustin was just down and sad. And Megan took him into our bedroom and he, he laid down on the bed and Megan lay, lay down next to him and was just tickling his back and, you know, and holding him and making him feel safe. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were really, really close. They yeah. were, um, you yeah, know, they were really close. Yeah. And, you know, there was just, just feeling of protection, you know, around them and love. And, um, and that's, that's just still, you know, jumps out to me today. I can actually physically see it every time, you know, I think about it. And, you know, it was just that acceptance and, you know, not trying to, get the kids to react in a certain way or be a certain way. It was just kind of meeting them where they were at and just loving them through it. Yeah. Whether that was listening to them, whether it was holding them, whether it was playing a game with them or taking them to the park, you know, it was just not trying to force an agenda. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, the other thing is to, you know, at whatever, you know, ages our kids were at when it was appropriate we were honest with them about, about questions that they had and just about, you know, like with me with, you know, they eventually had questions about my ex-husband and other relationships I was in. And I was honest with them about it, Mm -hmm. especially with my daughter, you know, um, communicating to her things that aren't okay. And, you know, she is such a good hand on her shoulders with all of that. Very wise. Um, but I know Craig too, like his whole thing when the kids were younger, like dames are trouble and, you know, (laughs) um, you know, like wait. And that's the thing we just, we just kept saying, be patient and wait and wait till you have a best friend and, you know, and try to do that first. And it's stuff that's totally counterculture to what society tells you, but I'm telling you, it makes all the difference. Yeah. Cause when I was young ish, I guess (laughs) under 20, um, or 21 or under, Every bad decision it seems I made had something to do with the relationship with a girl. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I just kind of, uh, you know, related that to them as be careful. Dames is troubles. <laughs> and, you know, you just not that they're that they're necessarily the problem. I was always the problem. But, right. you know, the, or maybe I, not making big decisions in your life when your life isn't even figured out yet. You know, and those kind of things, you know, basing decisions on on a girl or, you know, whatever. Gotcha. Yeah. Being best friends. Yeah. Well, very cool. And, and then, so something I ask every guest who comes on the show is what does being human mean to each of you? Being human means making lots of mistakes and giving each other grace to survive it. To me, being human means to love ridiculously, even when you seem like you're the craziest person on the planet. I just want to thank you guys for coming on the show today. And thank you. Yeah, it's been a great conversation. Awesome. We've had a good time, too. Yeah, I really appreciate it. So much fun. Don't you just love them as a couple? So sweet. Um For all the really cool things that they mentioned in this episode, including a link to that Desire app, go on over to the show notes at onbeinghumanpodcast.com front slash episodes front slash zero one four. Leave a comment, leave a question, and I hope you're inspired to go build some intimacy in your own life, not only on Valentine's Day, but every day. That being said, have a very happy Valentine's Day. So there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Tune in weekly at onbeinghumanpodcast.com for more soul-exposing explorations of what it means to be human. Until next week, love to you all.